Welcome back folks, it's me Matt, hope you're having a great day, we're talking about tracked vehicles again and the PL01 from Poland, a concept vehicle for the most part, never really came to a final realisation but a really cool bit of kit and when you actually study this thing you're kind of like well you know on paper it all sounds really really cool and when you look at it it looks even cooler, probably one of the most futuristic style tanks I've ever seen and putting into a concept phase and I can see some features of this vehicle apparent on many other military vehicles already out there today. Active protection systems, laser designators, all this sort of stuff. But the original idea of this tank was to be a development concept that was to replace the aging Polish fleet of T-72 M1 tanks. Now initially, the intended solution was to replace them with modern main battle tanks and attempts to modernize the T-72 ended with the PT-91 main battle tank. Another solution was the purchase of a number of Leopard 2 tanks modernization of which was planned for the Leopard 2 PL level by this year. A different approach was to design a fire support vehicle though. Lighter than a main battle tank, maximum weight was to be around 35 tons and we've talked a couple of times recently in some videos that I've done about these sort of fire support vehicles that aren't really tanks, aren't really infantry fighting vehicles, don't really match one of the two criteria but a bit of an in-between and they, with that being said, do have a bit of a struggle hitting beyond the drawing board but they were to be equipped with a 120mm smoothbore cannon. This gun would be capable of knocking out even the most modern main battle tanks and would be installed on an unmanned turret. Now interestingly enough there's a couple of other big contenders including the Leclerc and the T-14 Armada that went for the unmanned turret as well and it seems to be what's starting to hit the drawing boards a lot more with modern main battle tanks to this day and it's curious to me as to whether or not you know more Western nations are going to look into doing this, whether it be, you know, the Americans with the Abrams or the British with the Challenger 2. Are we uh, are we going to see manless turrets in the future for most main battle tanks? Hard to say. A lot of vehicles still have a lot of history, a lot of firepower still left in them, so I don't think we're going to see huge amounts of change to some of the key players that we already know of today, but it's an interesting concept, and maybe a video I'll do on in the future. So the point of the vehicle was to have the firepower of an MBT with even higher mobility compared to the massive western tanks at a fraction of the cost of a normal main battle tank at the expense of armour thickness. This set of conditions was formulated into an official Polish military WWB requirement and the OBRUM's answer to that was the PL-01 concept tank. The PL-01 unveiled to the public during 2013 International Defence Industry Exhibition in Kielce immediately attracted a ton of attention, mainly for the way that it looks. I mean, look at the thing. It looks like something off Halo or, you know, Star Wars, kind of crazy little bit of kit. I think it looks amazing, really sleek, but, you know, looks can be deceiving. We have to be very careful about how you polish a pig, uh, as we say. It may look very fancy with all the bells and whistles, but is it true to the armored fighting vehicle concept and, you know, principle that they want it to do? And personally, I didn't think it really hit the mark too much. It was developed by Obram in cooperation with BAE Systems on the CV-90 platform, specifically the CV-90-120T light tank variant, which is basically a CV-90 with a 120mm gun on top of it, which is pretty damn cool, because I love the CV-90 platform. I think it's fantastic. One of my favorite infantry fighting vehicles for sure. But notice how I said it's primarily an infantry fighting vehicle, and the same thing for the CV-90-120 is it's trying to be a tank, but not be a tank. It just doesn't make a huge amount of sense. The vehicle shown was basically a mock-up, but its advanced shapes, reminiscent of a stealth aircraft, immediately sparked a flurry of wild speculation from both the media, skeptics, and the public regarding the vehicle's alleged complete invisibility to radars and IR detection systems. Of course, there is a lot of technology advances out nowadays in terms of camouflaging of vehicles, but unfortunately, this technology is nowhere near being able to be representative of tanks being camouflaged in a modern day battlefield. The reality is that this kind of, you know, mosaic type camouflage that can be put on the side of vehicles to hide IR signatures and things doesn't quite work in the reality of things. Unfortunately, when you drive an armored fighting vehicle, mud sprays everywhere and it covers the side of your vehicle, it gets all over the place and totally uh, defeats the purpose of having this kind of technology. I'm not going to go into this technology today, but we will talk a little bit about it in the future. We'll see. Now, the reality was a lot more prosaic. 
The producer, Obram, claimed that the vehicle would be equipped with both anti-RF coating, making the vehicle hard to detect by radar, and exhaust cooling systems, the purpose of which to make it hard to detect by IR sensors. Of course, tanks produce a lot of heat inherently with the big old engines they need to move 35 tons of metal. That heat can be seen from a long way away. Interestingly enough though, the effectiveness of both of these kind of systems remains to be seen. Given the BAE origins of the PL-01, it's possible that elements from the CV-9120T Ghost advanced light tank would be used in the design, while the exhaust cooling was developed by Ubram for the previous Anders platform. In any case, both systems, while helpful in reducing the vehicle's trace on the battlefield, will certainly not grant it full invisibility, quote. And unfortunately, that was the hysteria when we looked at this tank. Because of its sharp angles, its stealth-type look, the F-22 grey paint colour, everybody was believing that this vehicle could be not seen in the battlefield, which was totally ridiculous. And unfortunately, there was a lot of misinformation going around about this tank. Whether it be, oh yeah, you know, this is going to be a direct vehicle into the platform of, uh, you know, main battle tanks. It's going to be the future. Uh, there was also some reports I'd heard of this actually not being a new vehicle. It was just a Merkava or Merkava uh, dressed up as a Polish tank. Um, baffling to me that you know that they would compare that kind of weapons platform to this. But hey, so the planned module armor was consisting of composite layers, protected the vehicle from basically 25 mm armor piercing discarded saber rounds and HE from a frontal angle Stanag 4569 level five and from Soviet 14.5mm armor-piercing bullets from the sides, Stanag 4569 level 4. While this protection is considerably lower than that of a contemporary main battle tank, the vehicle makes up for it with its mobility, firepower, and other protective measures that include smoke grenade launchers, um, which, just by the way, all tanks pretty much have smoke grenade launchers nowadays, and an active protection system. These are the little things that you know people focus so heavily on on these tanks is... Is the core structure of the vehicle good? Is its power plant good? Is its armament good? They're the three main things that you want to look at first. All the little extra amenities are great. You know, having APS is a really important thing nowadays. RPGs, you know, indirect missiles, all these sort of things that are going on. But for the most part, there's a lot of technology that's countering APS too. Top-down attack missiles, uh, kinetic energy projectiles. I've already talked about things like this. So you've got to be careful when we look at tanks like this. And it looks so shiny and cool, but... The reality is that it's just not hitting the mark for being a tank. Now, the estimated weight was between 30 to 35 tons. It was powered by a diesel engine boasting 940 plus horsepower, which is pretty considerable and pretty powerful for a vehicle of this size. Just to put in cons into perspective, I guess, the Warrior infantry fighting vehicle, when unarmored, had about half of that, maybe three quarters of that power, uh, and weighed about the same weight so considering that it's pretty formidable to say that this thing will fly when put through its paces now details are quite generally unknown about this vehicle but the power to weight ratio approximately 30 horsepower per ton is more than enough to make the vehicle go fast as about 70 probably 70 to 80 kilometers an hour on road even with additional armor plates attached now the unmanned turret is armed with either a fully stabilized 105mm or 120mm smoothbore cannon capable of firing all standard NATO ammunition and launching potentially guided missiles also. The gun is automatically loaded of course being that it is in an unmanned turret which we've done discussions on before and you know my opinion on it but it allows the crew to cut to only three men, commander, gunner and driver. Even though it should have a loader because you need a bitch to do all the other jobs, I'm just kidding. All located in the hull. The crew has extremely advanced electronics at their disposal, including various detection systems and a laser warning system. Now, some of this technology we see uh, has been produced on main battle tanks now. When this vehicle first came out and came into development in 2013, a lot of discussion was talked about all oh, this new active protection systems, all these new fancy things that they put on there. But, you know, I think only as of recently has the discussion become a lot more solid and we're actually saying, no, we're actually going to buy this stuff. It's no concept anymore. And I think the PL-01 was a bit of a catalyst to that conversation a little more. I know a lot of tank enthusiasts knew very little about APS, infrared systems, things like that, until the PL-1 came along, because until it came out, no one was discussing it at all. We saw a little bit of it with the T-14 Armada, 
But other than that, it was fairly new, and I personally did not know much about that technology, and so I saw it on the PL-01 and the T-14, and was like, wow, that's a little different. It's not just straight ceramic plates and steel anymore. It's actually preventing projectiles hitting the target, which was pretty cool. Now, the concept overall, although very, very unsuccessful, developed some really interesting dialogue and questions, which personally I think is fantastic for the future of Armored Warfare. Um, the crew being a three-man crew, we've seen it being developed into the T-14 Armada, into the sort of protected hull platform. We've already talked about the unmanned turret and the active protection system. But the development of the concept continued with BAE and Obram for quite some time, all the way until 2015, and it was announced that the vehicle uh, could enter production in 2018. However, in late 2015, questions started arising regarding the validity of the entire concept. Specifically, its inferior protection levels despite the presence of advanced electronics and active protection systems. This weakness is especially noticeable when comparing this concept with main modern battle tanks in the Polish service, such as the beautiful Leopard 2. These questions arose even before the crisis in Ukraine, but the tank battles taking place there have clearly shown that the age of the main battle tank is definitely not over. Another factor considered by the Polish Ministry of Defense is the appearance of the T-14 Armata and the other next generation Russian vehicles, capable of withstanding the firepower of the beautiful 120mm tank cannon and the making the main armament of the Gepard potentially obsolete. This issue is further accentuated by the Rheinmetall's announcement about the development of the new 130mm gun for the Leopard 2 and other chassis. As a result of these concerns though, the Polish MOD announced in February 2016 that the goals of the program were just completely different to what they were aligning to, and they would replace the obsolete main battle tanks to complementing the modernized MBTs in Polish service. Heavy armor would no longer be considered out of favor, making the future of the Gepard uncertain. Now it was claimed that the tank was able to launch anti-tank guided missiles in the same manner as ordinary rounds. Around 40 rounds were planned to be carried for the main gun, including 20 to 16 ready to use rounds, though it was unknown if it would be possible to replenish the autoloader on the battlefield. It was planned that a tank with a 105mm gun would be proposed for export customers. There is a coaxial 7.62mm machine gun also on board the vehicle, and a remotely controlled weapon station armed with another 7.62mm machine gun. Alternatively, the weapon station could be fitted with a 12.7mm heavy machine gun or a 40mm automatic grenade launcher. It was planned that the advanced fire control system of the tank would have a hunter-killer capability. A battlefield management system was also planned to be fitted. The vehicle was supposed to use the stealth technology, and I think a big portion of why the tank failed was there was so much misinformation and people were starting to look at this thing saying, what are you asking from this tank? What is it needing? What is it required to do? And if you want it to be a tank, you're just barking up the wrong tree. It's sad to say that, you know, the vehicle was a little bit doomed from the start. Um, it was based upon the chassis of the CV-90, which is a fantastic platform. And it's it's definitely relied upon from a basis of the armored fighting world um, for vehicles that it does what it needs to do. But when you start plugging things onto it that just aren't supposed to be there, and even I would say in some regard, the CV-90-120 is not a huge relevancy in today's modern battlefield it just doesn't make much sense i would have liked to see this thing though on the battlefield i know i keep kind of shooting it down a little bit but i truly do feel that this would have been a really cool vehicle to have on the battlefield as that intermediate fire support um in say urban environments or smaller battle groups that want to engage sort of reconnaissance units this is what really recce should be in my eyes um you know, you're probably saying, Mattis, why the hell would a recce unit have a 120mm gun? Well, remember, there is the 105mm option there, too. If you uploaded this thing with a ton of optics, very high speed, we're talking about almost 1,000 horsepower of diesel German engineering that's going to be pushing this thing along, it's going to fly. And as a reconnaissance vehicle, that's what you want. Uh, if we're going to talk about stealth and all these different types of technology to protect it and prevent it from being engaged and hide it, that's the way you want for recce, right? You want a vehicle that can do those kind of things. Interestingly enough, the PL-01 could also be fitted with a deep wading kit. So if you wanted it to cross rivers and streams, etc., you could do so. Another key attribute which would be great for recce. No limitations and go wherever it wants. So for me, the PL-01 concept was a really cool um, idea, but the core principle of it being what they wanted it to be, not so much. 
I appreciate you stopping by today, folks, to watch this video. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please leave me a like and some comments. If I did get anything wrong, feel free to correct me. I'm not perfect. Um, if you want to be notified of any upcoming videos in the future, please hit the little bell button by the subscribe button so you can be notified of upcoming videos. Uh, also, my links to my Patreon, my Facebook and everything is below. Those of you who have been donating towards my Patreon or to my channel in general, thank you so, so much for doing so. Truly can't express how much um, my followers and, and those who are supporting me and my channel mean to me. It means a lot. Um, so thank you for that. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. See you on the next one, folks. Bye-bye.